Hello and welcome to another episode of MetaDevs. Um, I have Darko with me today. Hi. And today we will be talking about uh, remote work versus hybrid versus in-person. What are the trade-offs of each one of those? What do they mean actually yeah. even? And um, hopefully Darko will get to the bottom of it and dissect this interesting topic. Hopefully, we'll see where it takes us. I mean, first, I think we have to discuss some definitions because especially like at, you know, the extremes in person and remote are, well, we can make an argument for, you know, that they are being, they are, they have been clearly defined. However, like what the hell does hybrid mean? Like it, it took to, took so many different meanings and it sort of evolved and different people tend to take different meaning from it. So... What do we do about hybrid? How do we define it? <laughs> yeah, and I actually think hybrid was... So, okay, there is a crucial point in time where COVID happened. Yeah. And so before, if we take this point in time and we can sort of compare be before and after. Um, so I think remote was very um, unpopular prior to COVID. There were a few companies here and there, but... Still. And freelancers and, you know, weirdos like yours truly. <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, then came Corona, COVID, and most of the companies went, okay, let's go full remote, whatever that means. And uh, now after Corona, we have this sort of weird Frankenstein called hybrid. <laughs> but <Yeah. laughs> I'm not really sure how we can define that mostly because i don't have experience be, uh, by working in, in such a company but uh, yeah frankly i had i don't really have first-hand experience with working with hybrid companies myself i've been either like fully in person or fully remote but i have some people that are very close to me that do this weird hybrid thing where it's defined as Mandatory two days in office and you're free to do the rest of the week, whatever you like, wherever you like, essentially. So as long as, you know, the work gets done. So to me, let's start with probably that because I have some bias on this topic and you know, it's probably productive to define it before we get into the weeds. Mm -hmm. I feel like hybrid should be defined as... Do whatever you like, wherever you like it, as where as long as the work gets done. So, hybrid, that definition of hybrid is sort of the most benign version. Let's say that a person can choose where they do their, their work at, you know, the time of their choosing and so forth. And according to their, you know, preferences and when, when they feel productive. So leave the person a choice. If they want to work like three or four days in the office, like leave them, let them do that. If they want to work fully remote, that's okay too, as long as, you know, there's the team dynamics allows for that. The team culture is okay with that. Mm. But, you know, I could also argue that most teams in IT, in programming especially, would should be able to function remotely regardless. Yeah, and uh, of course, the definition you said, I I will agree with it, but I would also add to that that there are different degrees of hybrid. So okay, I know there are certain companies that say something like, okay, you know, you have every Friday, you can work from home, and then Monday, Monday through Thursday, you can... I, I wouldn't call that hybrid, but okay. <laughs> well, th yes, exactly, but uh, they kind of market themselves as hybrid exactly. and uh, to, to some degree it can be considered as hybrid if we take the definition that okay you know a combination of working from home and working uh, in the office yeah but I I'm not I, I personally I don't uh, believe in in hybrid because um, you are either fully remote or distributed we'll get into those terms ah uh, okay or you are uh, in person. And um, it's very difficult to set up a system for a company or a culture that will work in both cases. Um, so, you know, if uh, I, I can talk a bit about Automatic and how things are set up mm -hmm. for the distributed mode of working. 
Um, but if you already have that set up, then in-person feels like redundant. And I would agree, yeah. Whereas if you don't have that set up, then in-person might be the only option. So hybrid, I... I like like I said maybe lack of experience but I personally don't believe in that kind of mode of working. Mhm. All right. All right, we can get into that a bit later yeah. why you know hold those wrong beliefs. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind, let's start with the pros and cons of the each of the extremes maybe. Let's start by discussing what are the pros of being in person only exclusively. Right. Okay. So just to clarify, we have the two extremes, in-person and remote. Mm -hmm. And starting with the pros, again, this is from experience mostly, but I would say one of the things I really miss the most is uh, socializing with people. Um, you know, I, I've been working remotely for the past uh, eight or nine years and I think you, you are in the same kind of uh, scenario mm, yeah and it's been definitely tricky to just see the other people as text on slack that they are nothing more than that right or maybe you can hop on a zoom call or whatever <laughs> but I would say the biggest pro for me is the in-person socialization with people mm -hmm. and then you know that also like carries its own kind of benefits like I remember this uh, co-worker, you know, we had like coffee um, near the water water cooler and he was chatting about how he found some interesting uh, f library framework language. I didn't even know what mm. it was at the time. It was called TypeScript. And so this was the first time I had heard of TypeScript <laughs> right. back in 2011 before it even became a thing. And, you know, this kind of spread of information, I think, is... Uh, best done in person mm -hmm. uh, likewise for this podcast um, and it's not that easy to achieve the same effect uh, when you know working remotely with co-workers right yeah what about you well all right like the in principle and you know i agree with the root of the idea like let's say that it, not really about the socialization part that mm -hmm. much, more about the, you know, random spread of ideas or unplanned spread of ideas. Mm. Have a chat with a coworker, get something going, mm. have an exchange of, you know, this or that kind. It often goes nowhere. I mean, that's true. But we've had some very productive discussions on like work breaks. Yep. When you're in the same space, let's say, work on the same idea, and then you go for a coffee or a smoke or whatever, and you start chatting about it. Like, it's inevitable. You know, it's uh, one of the things that binds you as people is the work you're doing. Mm -hmm. And often th that discussion, especially in IT, tends to be the case that people are discussing their work even on breaks, mm. you know, as as counterintuitive it sounds. Mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. like, most of us, at least to my experience, um, experience this profession as a big part of their personal identity. Meaning that... Is that good or bad though? That's, that's a different debate. Or maybe probably, it's a long debate. Let's not yes, get there Yes, and yet. probably a good <laughs> idea for an episode. Like, yeah. Yeah, we should write that. But I agree down. with you on this. And that means that some interesting things might happen just because of the physical presence of a bunch mm -hmm. of people, which otherwise just wouldn't be there. But beyond that, I don't find myself, you know, missing a lot of the physical presence workspace thing. Well, you know, there is another thing, actually, which it's easy to forget uh, how... It should how much it should be appreciated just because of our experience, I would say. But there is also the fact that onboarding new people oh, I agree. Um, is much easier when you know you are you are uh, dealing with them in person. True. Do some That's pair true. programming together. Go, you know, um, drink coffee, have lunch together because this this allows you to transfer the company's culture in a in a fast way to a newcomer 
So they would see like how other people are reacting, what they are chatting about, mm. things like that, and they would adjust to the culture. In a more spontaneous and unscripted mm. way, perhaps it's mm-hmm. yeah, 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 exactly. That's true. I agree yeah. that it would give you a more organic sense of exactly how the company culture is like, opposed to like being somewhere on this planet mm. behind the monitor. Yeah, and uh, I think another probably this was the first thing we should have started with, or I should have. To me, the most important bit is motivation. Yeah. Because to a junior programmer, motivation comes from f- for free uh, in the workplace they are working at. Whereas when you're working remotely, it's really there is nobody there to to motivate you. I mean, unless you can be motivated by bits and bytes. Mm-hmm. You know, most people get motivated by chatting or socializing with other people. Uh, but when you are working remotely, it's really on you. Yeah. To schedule your time to, to finish the tasks or whatever. And this, you know, in my experience, this came for free in the workplaces. So that was pretty amazing. Um, and learning how to self-motivate was, yeah, it took some time. It could come off a bit as like, I want to have a manager. <laughs> no, it, it does sound <laughs> a bit like that. Like, yeah. I need an adult to, you know, take care of my stuff. Which yeah. I do agree that... For some people, it sort of works. I imagine that for the people that prefer in-person working, this might be a part of the Mm. reason, sure. Yeah. Personally, I'm pretty binary with motivation. Like, I either really enjoy doing something or, like, I deeply hate doing it. And (laughs) my career choices have generally been informed by that. (laughs) Yeah. But, yeah, I can see that people that are not like me and are more, you know, moderate and not on the extremes of that spectrum, would certainly see benefit from a more organized environment. Yes, exactly. Um, any more co- pros? I don't I don't think I have any. I've, I've tried finding more, but... Maybe no, we can I'm go back a blank. To if we remember yeah. something. But should we hop on to the cons? Yeah, yeah, certainly. I can start with the cons. I think for me, the biggest cons is working in an office felt like time waste most of the time. I agree. Um, You are bound to sit there for eight or nine hours. um, But there's a caveat to that continue and then I'll (laughs) take over. (laughs) Uh, Like with any of these discussions, there there are a lot of caveats. (laughs) But personally, I have the experience that even though I'm eight or nine hours in the office, I'm really productive for like four or five hours. And then the rest is just like mm, noise in the sense of, um, you know, um, figure out where to have lunch, then go have lunch. I I mean, not noise in the negative way, but noise in the sense that um, it's, you are not productive actually, which is, I assume, what companies are looking for. Um, uh, so um, I, I would say that, and you know, with uh, comparison to remote, there is a lot of flexibility how you schedule your time, whether you do, go do some grocery shopping or go to the banks or whatever, yeah. get some errands finished. So I, I really appreciate that from, from the remote. But yeah, when you are bound in the office, even if you have to step out for like an hour, do some bank or whatever thing pay the taxes you still have to let the manager know so yep. it feels like you need permission you need permission and it feels like you are getting some time off yeah it's it's it, it can feel like you're sort of cheating the system when in fact like you're not cheating anybody out of anything mm. and if we start from the point that four maybe five if we're generous hours are your productive time per day with, you know, brain work and stuff. Yes. And we define the working day as eight hours. What are we doing with the rest three or four? Like it's either coffee breaks or in startup cases, most of our Mm. startup cases have been beer breaks or, you know, doing Mortal Kombat on PlayStation or stuff like that. And that you wouldn't really define that as productive time. Mm. Like anybody, nobody would could make an argument that's downtime and downtime helps you you know recover for more productive time but we're still living in that window of eight hours 
it's not like you, you don't get that like uh, I'm going to work for four consecutive hours we don't do that yes. and then we take a break and then we continue no like that's just tomorrow tomorrow is, we will continue working anyway but back to the caveat I wanted to mention the office thing is um is not a limitation for me personally. I, I would like to have, in general, a separate space in which uh, I can do just work. And I usually do nothing else there. Like, as is this space where we're currently recording this thing. So, it's an office for me, but there's nobody that's limiting my choices about <laughs> where, when I come or when I go or, you know, anything like that. I don't have to ask permission from anybody mm. to do whatever i can just go and do it so office not in the physical sense but office in like more of the conceptual sense i would say office in which there is this let's say this caricature of pointy pointy haired boss <laughs> that you know <laughs> is here to you know make your life miserable <laughs> so you would have to ask that person permission that's not really for me and i've been doing you know, I've been exclusively remote for quite a while now, and that's probably the number one reason I, I can never see myself going back to, you know, in-office work. Mm. Yeah, I, I can see that. I mean, although there is a possibility for the same pointy-haired boss to be bossy over Slack. I mean, sure, but you can just ignore him. <laughs> it's easier to ignore them. That's the thing. Right. Like, and... You could probably plan your exit better yeah. <laughs> without the Actually, emotional yeah. pressure from somebody that's, you know, entitled mm. to, you know, your time. <laughs> yeah. And when hard things are being said or hard things are supposed to be done, you also have the free time to process it Yeah, working remotely. So, yeah, I can, I, I would agree to that. Cool. The uh, distance is not essential. Is not necessarily a bad thing. Like that's the thing. Yes. It has pros and cons, of course. But mm. the more I think about it, the more pros I can see. So, <laughs> <laughs> as we get older, yes, as we get older, yeah, we we get more, you know, eccentric and more set in our ways, mm. and we tend to be, you know, less cooperative and less flexible with you know yeah. other people's specificities so <laughs> yeah i mean yeah in my 20s i've had different kinds of managers and i felt like nothing can piss me off let's say ah. but that's yeah it has changed um but uh, i would i would agree to that yeah definitely i i no i, I would not say less cooperative but i would say perhaps less tolerant to bullshit ah yeah 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 Agreed. Yes, my tolerance to bullshit is pretty much at an all-time low. Right, I'm getting pretty, you know, easily emotional and aroused around <laughs> bullshit. Yeah, <laughs> we can just probably leave it at that. This is not the episode for horror stories. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> we'll see where this takes us. Cool. Any other cons? Hmm. I'm trying to think of another one. Maybe the meetings and getting together in the same room mm. the easiness of that scheduling mm. meetings because when you have people in the same space it's significantly easier to get them in a room let's say five mm. of them of your co-workers opposed to like struggling with a bunch of calendars and typing on slack or whatever mm. and trying to you know get people in a let's say a google meet whatever so that's probably a a pro actually of in-person work well it could be treated as both but i would say it's much easier to do those meetings when everybody's at home hmm. there is there is some kind of flexibility involved but the scheduling part the scheduling part is tricky in both scenarios um but um yeah i mean yeah you know having to physically gather four or five people um, could be challenging yeah. in, in, in the office. Some of them, you know, maybe are uh, like AFK or running for errands or whatever. Uh, so you are essentially you are bound to the in, in office schedule. Mm -hmm. And whereas, you know, like we said with, with remote, you can, you have the freedom to, to um, 
maintain your own schedule. So what I do, you know, usually if I know I have a meeting at 3 p.m. and right now it's 12, yeah. I would just like go do the stuff that needs to be done, taking kids to school, whatever. Plan my time around the meeting. Whereas in the office, um, you know, if the meeting is there, then you, you have no no way out. You just have to stay, even if you have no work to, to do or whatever, mm -hmm. you have to stay until 3 p.m. to get through the meeting. So, I, I yeah, I, my argument is that there is more flexibility in meetings from home, although most of the disadvantages are, you know, can be, are, are common between yep. both modes of working. Um, and then another cons that I wanted to share also was uh, shipping to production or <laughs> working during weekend, weekends. I, All right. I have had the, you know, um, when I was working in an office, there, there it did not happen as often, fortunately, but it did happen a couple of times. And when it did, it felt like, okay, this weekend is completely gone. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, you are in the office with few other coworkers, uh, you know, your family is at home or whatever, uh, waiting for you. And, um, Comparing that to remote, you are still at home. So, you know, if you have like an hour or two hours to do something, you just do it and then you continue with your weekend. Whereas in the office during the weekend, you know, you are there, everybody is there. So mm. you ship something, wait for something to hit and you just wait, wait, wait. So all of that was, a, in my experience, was a huge waste of time. Yeah. True. I mean, there's also one obvious thing that we didn't mention as a con, the commute time. Right. Yeah. Like the commute time is sort of an opportunity cost, let's call it. That's um, maybe over here, it's not that much of a big deal. But imagine like in really big cities, like let's say the New Yorks or whatever of mm. the world, where traveling for an hour is not unheard of or more sometimes, which yeah. is, you know, like... To me and my biased brain, really fucking crazy. I mean, what the hell? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, even in smaller cities like Skopje, I mean, my workplaces were never more than 10 kilometers away from yeah. home. But still, you know, took in some cases hour, hour and a half, you, you know, like traffic conditions yeah, or yeah, weather yeah. or whatever. So the, the time more or less, yeah, with, with our infrastructure was never less than an hour actually yep. for me to get there. So, you know, if you multiply that by two, you go there, you go back, and then the eight or nine hours, basically your half of, half a day is gone in work. Yeah, which is not really great for that magical work-life balance thing. Like, you're expected to stay eight hours in the office, mm -hmm. but nobody, like, mentions those two theoretical hours that you spend in traffic. Right. I mean, that's... That's time away from your own personal stuff, mm. family, hobbies, whatever you want to do, you know. And that's that's a pretty big sacrifice. Right. They're not paying you for 10 hours. They, pay, they are paying you essentially for eight, which sounds like not a good deal. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, I just remember there is also the office temperature thing. I mean, literally in every office I worked, you have two types of people. <laughs> Oh my god. Those yeah, people that. who are very hot at all times and those people who are very cold at all times. Yeah. So the office temperature was always a debate in every in any company that I worked in. So you in know. open space office. Right. Yes. Actually, if you have yeah. like small cubicles or stuff like that, it's not that much of a problem. But still. Yeah, fortunately I, I never had to work in a cubicle and I would prefer not to. I mean I <laughs> I, I see that as the most horrible workplace. So th this is my experience. I, I, I would know. It's interesting because like in the West, in, so in some places in the US, is sort of seeing a resurgence in popularity. Like people actually... Really? Yeah. Wow. Like they, they, I just read a Twitter thread a couple of weeks ago or something in which like there were people that actually were pro working in cubicles. But I see that sort of as reactionary towards the enforcing the open space thing at all times you get mm. no fucking privacy whatsoever which is dumb mm. you know you at, at all times there's somebody like that could stare at your screen you don't get to do anything like yeah. outside of 
here's my editor and I'm coding all day long, which is, you know, like we, we don't really work like that. Come on. Yeah, I, I, I can definitely understand and appreciate actually the, the privacy, the private space. Um, but I have yet to see a company that has a, like hybrid in the sense of cubicles and open space. So yep. when you feel like you need privacy, go in the cubicle. And- Actually, there were some, but I don't exactly remember. They had like this interesting floor plan in which like if you wanted to work in a private space, there are like private spaces mm. and you go and do your thing. If you want to you look, mingle with people, there are open spaces as well. And mm. as long as you're productive, go do your thing. It doesn't matter, which is... Actually, not doesn't sound that bad for working in a in a, you know physical space together with people. Yeah. Not that I would like to do that. <laughs> in my experience, it was only the managers that had like their own private space. Yeah, but that but, was probably in you know inherently bad environments to start. Right. With, right. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I'm actually like I said, you know, most horrible cubicle, but uh, if used in this fashion, actually that sounds like a good idea. I definitely. Love to try that and see the benefits of that. I know that we also have some co-working spaces here in Skopje mm-hmm. that offer that, um, but um, I don't see people using it too much. They, some of them have been popular. Like I see people using them, mm. but not just people like companies and so forth, like smaller companies that don't need or don't want a dedicated office. Because, you know, it's... Hybrid times, you know, it's people don't really go to the office that much. Mm, and yeah. from the financial perspective, a co working space might even make more sense than renting an entire office with all the amenities and, you know, everything that comes with that. So, co working spaces are becoming a bit more popular than they were, like, let's say, six, seven years ago or something like that. Cool. Um, do we have anything more to extract or shall we rewind the stack? Well, not rewind the stack, but I had a question. Like, it sort of popped into my head after like six or seven minutes in while we're recording this. Mm. What's your ideal workspace? Describe your like your <laughs> ideal working conditions. Like, what combination of like in person, remote, bosses, no bosses, floor plans? I don't know. <laughs> actually, that's a great question, and I, I can. Uh... Actually, if we rewind the stack and start talking about remote slash distributed, I think I will provide an answer to that question. So just some brief context. Um, Turning seven years at Automatic, Mm -hmm. which is a fully distributed company, like they want to call themselves. And we can maybe expand a little bit on what it means to be distributed. Sure. Um, so remote is, like you said, you know, either working as a freelancer, working from home, and then you just have your laptop and you just do some stuff. That's like uh, a pretty simple definition of remote. Now, distributed, um, to my understanding, is if you imagine a graph where each node in this graph is a person in the comp- that's working in the mm-hmm. company. And, you know, obviously this person in the graph has connections to other nodes, which are, we can, you know, uh, define what those connections mean. But essentially, <clears throat> distributed mode really means um, if you take on one or multiple nodes from that graph, things will still keep going. Yeah. So st- things uh, keeping going, even though some of the nodes were removed. And I'm not saying like nodes were removed by being fired or whatever, just some regular stuff like AFK or, you know, sabbatical or vacation or whatever it is. Um, and so distributed really in the sense that this whole graph can be dis- is distributed means that whatever, the, whatever they're working towards can continue continue working if mm-hmm. you know replace switch add remove gears to the or nodes to the graph yeah so there are a lot of tools and this is by the way a very high level definition and you know there are a lot of tools how you can achieve all of this um, like you know communicating asynchronously communicating synchronously when necessary you know on live meetings or whatever online meetings um, how to do research, how to do pair programming, all of those bits, how to document. Technical writing is a really important thing in this aspect. And um, so um, now back to the question. I would say, and uh, by the way, I've been working remotely 
before joining automatic but having joined automatic um in this kind of distributed mode of working uh, i would prefer this over anything fortunately for me i have the experience of working st- started working in an office mm-hmm. then moved to work remotely for a company where I was literally an asset, you know. I we had like daily stand-ups or, or a resource, whatever. Oh, yeah, um, so we have like daily stand-ups, resources, <laughs> assigned tasks to me. I'm finishing the tasks tomorrow. Another daily stand-up, finish this, move on to the next. So you are not really part of the company. You are essentially a contractor slash freelancer slash whatever. A cog in the machine. Cog in the machine, exactly. Where you are very unnecessary. You just like do some stuff. And, but, easily replaceable and all of that yeah so this was still early in my career and I, I'm, I'm happy that i had this opportunity to to see it because if i did not have the opportunity how would i be able to compare yeah right? true um so having joined uh, automatic with this distributed mode of working i think this is my preference uh in the sense of the work part now the life part which i think your question was about um i don't have a strict wake up hours mm-hmm. sometimes or i would say it's usually in the range of between 8 and 11 a.m but i never wake up at the same hour every day it's like uh you know some days it's like uh, 12 p.m if i decided to game uh, uh late last night or whatever um your kids all grown up and all of right. that, so you don't have to worry about waking up yes. early and at weird times. Yeah, no, certainly kids are <laughs> kids are a constraint, but uh, in this case, uh, you know, if we focus only on the constraints imposed by the company, mm-hmm. uh, and you know, if if the company does not impose these constraints, it's it's really great because you have total freedom and autonomy yeah. to both schedule your time when you do the work, what work needs to be done, communicate with other folks. And so this has a lot of benefits, you know, like speaking from a high level perspective, we can get into the the benefits. But one benefit is I'm always I feel like I'm always there for my family. Mm -hmm. So things like, hey, we need to do some shopping for Christmas. Right. Yeah. Okay, I cannot do it right now, but I can do it at like 5 p.m. Mm -hmm. after my meetings or, um, you know, another benefit is uh if I, you know, decided for some reason to stay uh, until late last night, I don't need to wake up at 8 a.m. feel feel like zombie. I yeah. can just, like, wake up and wh- whenever I need to, unless there are meetings, of course. Meetings are always an exception. Um, but I don't see a reason in, you know, waking up every day at the same time. And by the way, this is how... I schedule my life, so it's right. not, you know, but... S- sounds kind of chaotic, but if it works, <laughs> it, it, it works. Is, it is chaotic to a degree, but my point was that there are no constraints imposed by the company. Mm-hmm. Because the company does not care if you do your work like 6 p.m. or yeah. 8 p.m. or 9 p.m. unless it's something that needs to be shipped at a specific time on a, or unless it's a specific meeting. So there are exceptions, as, as always, but in the general... Um, sense it doesn't matter and this freedom allows me to be focus more on my family but also on myself so sometimes when i feel like um slacking i'll just pick up a book and read it in the middle of quote-unquote work hours Mm -hmm. yeah (laughs) or play some video game now the way you describe this chaotic would definitely agree um, because I feel more and more how work and life are intertwined in my setup. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying this is the best setup, and it's something I'm continuously experimenting with, but um, it's been quite interesting so far, and I'm probably keeping this mode of working for some period. Mm-hmm. Um, but I have definitely, you know, I, I would like, do something at 1 or 2 p.m. And then when I get a ping at 9 or 10 p.m., I would respond to it or do some work late in the night. So it's it's a it's a chaos for sure. Yeah, there's there was this interesting blog post. Like, it was a while ago. Maybe, like, let's say 10-ish years ago or something like that. There were this couple, freelancers, and mm-hmm. they had, like, three kids and two dogs. And they were, like, living this nomadic lifestyle before it was cool, traveling <laughs> around the planet and all of that. 
there was this blog post in which uh, one of the people mentioned something to the tune of screw work-life balance. Work-life integration is where it's at. Like you don't get to neatly choose when, you know, some certain things happen. Like, you know, life happens. Kids get sick. You have to be somewhere. You have to go to the bank, Mm. blah, 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 whatever. And it doesn't really make a ton of sense to constrain those time slots and especially when you're living like nomadic lifestyle and stuff like that it's not strictly applicable to what you were saying but it sounds like you're integrating like work and life in a pretty you know straightforward fashion it's a line yeah it's sort of like maybe a squiggly chaotic line but it's still a line and it's not something that you have two halves of basically you split one from the other yeah, I mean, that's how I see it to a degree. But also, I, I, you know, I'm kind of envious at people who, you know, so like 4 p.m. comes, they close mm-hmm. the lid and that's it. Ah, yeah. And em- <laughs> envious in the sense, you know, I, so the way my brain works, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm reflecting very often on things I've been working on or pe- people I have interacted with, things like that. And The way my brain works is if I were to set such a schedule where 4 p.m. I close the lid. I I tried this and it Mm -hmm. didn't work. And I, you know, would drive the car, go somewhere. And, you know, while driving the car, I would think about work. So does this count as work time or not? Mm, ah, Yeah, it's it's problematic with, you know, brain work, intellectual work in any kind. You don't exactly leave your work. You you sort of carry it with you around. And it's not, you know speaking uh, when we're thinking about uh, classical work theory Mm -hmm. essentially that means that you're not really working on a line you're not producing something yes and you're not leaving the factory behind you're sort of carrying it with with you and nobody pays you for that time whatever Mm -hmm. and but I've had also encounters you know with people who they close the lid I would have some beers with them after work and they don't talk about work so Weirdos. I, I mean, <laughs> exactly. And I'm envious because how dare they? My brain is, you know, it's uh, weirdos. I, I agree with you, but I would say we are the weirdos. No, we we are the weird one for sure. Yeah. I was just being sarcastic. <laughs> um, but I think yeah, this is a really good discussion. I think you mentioned at the start or uh, uh, in the beginning that uh, you know so- something along the lines of. Um, now I'm, I'm I'm blanking, but I think it was about uh, separating work and life, and uh, how 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 you structure your your um, your job. But in in general, yeah, I think it at the end of the day, it all boils boils down to personal preference. Yeah, for sure. So, what is your ideal setup? I, I mean, would you change something from, from would, your current setup? So, yeah, that's actually, yeah, going back to the original question, I'm, an, you know, and change is actually a very interesting word here because I'm changing things mm-hmm. all the time, but I'm changing them like baby steps. Oh, yeah. And experimenting like a, you know, quote unquote, little scientist. Um, sometimes I try, you know, I, I, I've tried like having a regular eight to four, even an automatic and... I didn't like it. Mm-hmm. Um, now I'm, you know, in sort of like this semi chaotic mode and kind of like it, but I would not say I would stick to this for like the rest of my life. Mm-hmm. The only suggestion I would make to people is just experiment, see what sticks, yep. and if you get bored by that, do more changes. Yeah, just uh, iterate and iterate. Just and iterate. iterate. But yeah. the most important bit I, I would like to reemphasize here is that the, the the biggest prerequisite is that the, the company that you're working for does not impose any constraints mm-hmm. on this. Because if you are constrained, uh, by definition, you know, you cannot experiment. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, if there is like some defined hardcore rules, you don't really get the benefit of like mm-hmm. trying new things out. There's like a framework and you need to follow that framework. So. So, yeah, you know, my ideal setup, I don't think I can give an answer to the question. Mm-hmm. That's uh, cool. Because it's like a moving target. Of course. Uh, but I would guess my ideal setup is experimentation. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lovely answer. I like that. Uh, now I can actually boomerang that question back at you. Sure. I mean, actually, I think I have my ideal working setup. <laughs> 
as weird as it sounds. Like, I have this office thing here, mm -hmm. which I'm lucky enough to share with a hacker space, actually. And it's, it's pretty awesome. And I have the benefit of having a workspace that's separate from the place I live. It's, it's not that I can't work at home. I can, but I need to sort of uh, be in a different space to be really productive. Okay, see, now you are better than me at work-life balance because <laughs> I'm doing most of my work in the living room. <laughs> yeah, no, I can't. I, I could certainly work in my living room. I've done it before, but after a while, I'm working there and working there. I can't stand that place anymore. Mm. It starts to, you know, annoy me. And like, it's lunchtime or something. And like, I'm like, like this. I don't want to be in that space. You mm. know, I just want to fuck off and be somewhere else. No, no it's, uh, I, I would, uh, you know, changing physical places, mm -hmm. spaces is definitely uh, important. And um, I've been sort of working around that by hanging out with you and other people, drinking beers and things like that. But uh, yeah, just try not to stay in a single place. Yeah. Keep moving. So yeah, that, that's the thing exactly. Like that's why I consciously decided mm. that I don't really wor work for, I don't really want to work from home. Unless there's a caveat, of course, if I had a separate physical space that I could call my office, let's say inside my house, I could see myself working from home. But then again, I'm sort of a gamer as well. And like the, I don't want to, you know, share my play space with my workspace as well because mm. it's a different energy and a different mindset for myself. So I again decided that the place that used to be my office at home is just going to be a dedicated mm. gaming space. And that's it. Like I'm not going to be working there unless I can help it. You know, if sometimes we have to be at home and work from home for whatever reason, like whatever, kids sick or something, you have to stay at home. I have the place and I have like the infrastructure to support that. But if I have a choice, I'm just coming here and doing my work here. Yeah, and uh, actually I appreciate that kind of separation of spaces because it definitely helps the brain set the context. Mm -hmm. So yeah, exactly. if you are in the gaming room, um, yeah, you feel like a gamer. If you are in the programming room. Um, you're there to have fun and you're in the other, other place to work. It's not that work cannot be fun, but you know, it's really about the mindset you get yourself into. For mm. me, at least it's like that. It's really about mindset. Yeah, uh, but you know, I, I don't know. the be So the reason why I love working in the living room is I actually prefer white noise, or mm -hmm. background noise, not white noise. Um, because silence... You, okay, yeah, there are sometimes cases where I actually need silence, you know, when I'm deep thinking or whatever, or doing some research. Um, so in this case, I would go to, you know, the bedroom or whatever. Um, but... I don't know. Most of the time when I'm doing work, uh, I feel like the background noise is actually energizing me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, un un like I said, unless it uh, again becomes, uh, you know, um, the thing that I need to remove. So th mm -hmm. in this case, I would, I would not prefer that. But most of the times it actually work. And uh, I've actually spoken to some people who have difficulties focusing in this kind of setup mm -hmm. and you know to me I, I i never had the problem but um yeah it's it's just interesting to me how there are like different perspectives and preferences and um, some people prefer one thing over another thing but uh yeah i i don't think we'll find an answer to this question actually no, it's, like a general answer we'll just like go in circles and it's like heavy uh, the only thing I could probably generalize that is that, you know, spoken like a true senior, it depends. Of course, it depends on the person <laughs> and your own personal preferences. The thing I really am hired about is the fact that office policies tend to force people into doing things that they aren't productive with and they aren't comfort and circumstances, mm. circumstances they aren't comfortable in. And that way, essentially, you're just, you know, screwing up the productivity of the team. You're not really helping your case that much. And 
you know, if your turnover rate might be high, you may want to look into that office policies mm. and hybrid setups and whatever. So on that note, let's go back to hybrid maybe. <laughs> How do we define hybrid in like maybe the most general sense? Mm. That's a good question. I mean, you know, a lot of companies are kind of marketing or selling themselves as hybrid Basically nowadays. everybody, like get this, like I, I, I told you about this one before we started recording and it's like... The, this definition of hybrid, like we have this modern office, like it's a new office, like, you know, we get it. And y- you, you get to work from home every now and again. What, what, <laughs> what the hell? Like, what does that even mean, man? Like you get to work from home once a month pending HR approval. Jesus. I mean, like I'm hired. At it, so <laughs> no, yeah. I mean, I would not definitely call that hybrid or nope. every Friday off or every second Friday off or you know, um, but having said that, I am not sure what I would define as hybrid. It's a mm-hmm. uh, uh, really tricky thing to define. Um, so if a company has like their own offices and people usually go there, mm-hmm. anytime they don't go to this office feels like a reward. So working from home feels like, like a reward. I have not had the chance uh, to experience such kind of setups. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying they are non-existent, but I I would definitely love to see how that looks like. Um, so automatic is fully distributed, but there is a catch. Mm-hmm. Um, three times per year, we on average we travel to have like meetups mm-hmm. one week each. So I would not call this hybrid. It's more like. No, Nine, come on. 95% I mean, that's like, at home, 5% not at home. That's remote the year. with a very small, like, fine print that doesn't right. really matter that much. So, so, could classify automatic as on the one extreme, yeah. like, fully distributed. And then I could, I have also had the experience to work in, um, you know, in person uh, companies on the other extreme. But what is in the middle? I, I cannot really... I mean, let's maybe start with the semantics. Like, just if we're talking about hybrid, we're probably talking about a combination of both. We could probably, and everybody on this planet can Mm -hmm. probably agree to that. But let's get into the fairness of things. Like, what's what's a fair combination? What's, What's the minimum fair combination of those two modes of working in which a company would be uh, able to call their work mode hybrid? What's a fair... It's a great question, you know, but there there are a lot of things in play. There is that question, but I have another question, which is what what do we do about the redundancy factor? So if your company is set up in such a way that it can function distributed or remotely, Mm -hmm. is not going to the office uh, redundancy? So you have the commute time. So yes, again, to my initial argument, choice, like let people work where they're most productive. Okay. If they want an office, you know, provide them with an office. If they don't want to come to that office, don't force them to come to that office. It's as simple as that. Do you know a group of people who would say yes to want an office? Actually, yes. Oh, I I, I don't. But I, I would be curious to hear, like, what's the rationale between, be, behind that sort of... I would say that, let's say... Okay, without mentioning particular professions, but let's say we imagine a spectrum. We have non-technical people and staff on one side and technical people and staff on the other side. The more you go towards the technical part, the less you encounter people that want to do in-person work. It's not that they're like not, they don't exist. There are people that like to be in office spaces okay they, and for the most part they are this you know stereotypical extroverted people that you know get energized by being in the same space right. with other motivation people. we talked about yeah but you know stereotypes exist for a reason and most of us in it are sort of wallflowery nerds that are introverted and so forth and I would say that that sort of biases the percentage the more you go towards more technical staff in a company. Okay. So okay. you could probably extrapolate who I mean, like mm. in terms of like titles and so forth by this without mentioning that. Yeah, no, no, that makes sense, you know. And I think the one thing that you actually mentioned, I would also say that in, even though most of the programmers, like high percentage are uh, introverts, I think 
things like solving a hard problem together mm -hmm. or learning something or doing like group research. I I think those things are actually done much with with higher efficiency in the office. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's been my experience as well. Like if back to our previous R&D episode, like we sort of repeated at many iterations that we had some of our most productive times when we were together with an office trying to, you know, break down a hard idea. Right. Or, you know, like try to solve a hard problem that we didn't know how to begin with mm. solving. So... No, you know, what? what is most interesting to me if we assume this company exists, which gives total freedom to people um when how to go oh, to they do. office they do exist yes 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 for the decent hybrid companies actually let their own employees decide for themselves when they want to work or whatever of course there are caveats like sometimes there is a meeting where we all need to be there like mm. that's not unreasonable of an ask in at least in my opinion but in general yes they do exist um, Automatic had an office in San Francisco and a couple of years ago they closed it because nobody went there. <laughs> Why would they? <laughs> um, I mean, sure, it's San Francisco, it's posh and whatever. But yeah, whatever. but you know, this goes back to the question I asked you, which in my experience, and you know, obviously now I'm extrapolating from Automatic's culture because mm -hmm. people within Automatic yep. decided not to go to the office. But, you know, there are I think a lot of uh, things that will be affected in the company culture. So one example is um, if people decide not to go to the office and do all the work from home, then you lose the, the efficiency in doing like group research, the things that we mentioned. Yep. But now you are on your own basically most of the times. I'm not saying you're all the time on your own. But you are, there is a certain degree of autonomy that is, you know, given to you and also expected from you uh, and a certain degree of ownership that you have on the projects. So um, if you say something like, I'm stuck, really cannot handle this, of course, you know, you can, you can sort of uh, do some pair programming, Zoom calls, whatever. But if things are hard and you are not really stuck, you just have to keep pushing forward. Yep. And... People within the company decided not to go to the office. So people themselves decided they want to push forward themselves, uh, which leads to the other thing we discussed earlier about how, you know, this distributed graph um, with nodes, each one of those nodes, their individuality increases. Yep. So there is less dependence on other nodes. Whereas, you know, yeah, if you go with three or four people in an office and you do like a group research, you basically are the biggest owner on this project and there is no visibility as to what decisions were made, what research was made. And at Automatic, this visibility is uh, text-written uh, form. So you're kind of forced to write it. It does take more time. Mm -hmm. It's not the ideal in the sense of efficiency. But at the same time, I don't think Automatic is optimizing for that. So... It's it's definitely you know definitely plays a huge role uh, with uh, the company's culture I would say yeah and I would say that that's probably the case for most distributed companies mm. you have to sort of adapt to the cons or the downsides of not being in the same physical space and you have to like devise tools to deal with those situations yes. of course whether it's pair programming like group sessions mob programming whatever no, even workshops things like yeah, that even that like or you know forcing rfcs and writing before you like crystallize an idea and like commit it to code or whatever but yeah, yeah it's it's an adaptation i would say and maybe we're still in the process of finding good enough tools to replace or maybe emulate well enough the presence uh, the physical presence of people in the same office yeah I would say yeah definitely tools do help but at the same time I think all of this boils down to personal preference yeah and um, yeah just uh, keep experimenting because you don't want to miss out on the perspectives yeah absolutely and like for me personally like sort of the takeaway general is like uh, 
my personal takeaway is you're no chance in hell you're getting me in, in an office. I have my own and like <laughs> I'm done with this. Like I don't want to like come to yours because I have like my ideal space mm. and I'm really productive here and I'm keeping this thing. In general, however, I do agree with you. Like um maybe let your employees have a say in how you work. Sort of as a takeaway. That ask them, talk to them, don't impose like you know, hard rules or whatever on them and don't make them jump through hoops to, you know, be allowed to work from home in situations when they need to, for example. So, And I would actually generalize what you said and ask them, see what they want. Communication is a huge tool Regardless if you are hybrid, remote. Are you working in developer experience by chance? (laughs) And I actually think that we (laughs) might have a whole session on communication. Yeah, that's that's probably a good uh, episode as well. That would be great content. And beyond just like communicating in person, but also ways of communication, you know, even PR reviews as type of communication. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. um, um, I think there is a lot of things to extract in that topic as well yeah for sure so cool we can probably wrap this up but what are we going to do we did books we did games what are we doing next books and games um not quite sure actually i i tend to shift between okay oh there is also the netflix thing what are you watching um so actually my i tend to shift mostly between books and games Mm -hmm. So Netflix is mostly just for like when I'm literally, you know, without any energy. Mm -hmm. So something to chill. Most of the things I'm watching, like, I don't know, uh, Brooklyn Nine-Nine, very, very easy, very chill. Yeah, that's Uh, lovely. uh, Young Sheldon. So all all of those things that don't require you to think. Mm -hmm. Uh, So that's the the way I use Netflix most. But I, I usually shift between books and games. Cool. Cool. I'm personally currently binging a ton of anime and like even yeah okay there's we can get into the argument about what actually is anime but let's say western anime on Netflix <laughs> uh so I've been binging Castlevania it's like amazing in case you haven't watched it especially the new one and I've been watching this show called Berry which is has been a recommendation from a friend it's it has an interesting premise so I would also highly recommend that one as well. So we can probably close this one up, right? Yep. So you did the opening, you do the closing again. (laughs) Thanks for watching us. Thanks for listening to us. Hopefully we extracted tons of information. Um, And see you all in the next episode. See you next time. Bye.